were to just take in some girls into our home. If they need a place to stay, they can live with us. If they need transportation to doctor's appointments, I'll drive them. If they need maternity clothes, I'll buy it for them, whatever. People started hearing about what we did and said, hey, you know, I've got this old stroller. Do you need it? Sure. We used a room at church, and then that got too small, and then we had it all in our garage, and then that got too small. So I said to my husband, we need a building. We have to build something so that it's an actual store where single moms can come and get whatever they need, and it'll be free. The reason I wanted to be involved with Rusty Cope was Connie. When I heard her talk at a youth event, one line that stuck with me that she said that night was that if you're gonna look at that girl in high school that's pregnant and say, can't you abort it? Then you gotta be there for that girl and that baby afterwards. Hey, Connie. Hi, Carol. How are you doing? Connie came up with an idea that is opening doors for, for everybody. In the beginning, I thought that there was such a need, but even bigger, I feel like there's just such a generosity. Everybody wants to help. Everybody wants to do something. Everyone has gifts. To be able to help 400 women a month and to still have plenty of clothes on the racks, plenty of everything, because so many more people are donating. God keeps blessing it. my family since my dad was an eighth grader. She was a religion teacher way back in the day. She always told my dad, if you ever need anything, I'm here. Hi, Jess, how are you? Destiny was actually the first baby that Connie helped in this ministry when she got started, and it just grew from there. My mom had been in and out of jail for DUIs. The first one, she only went away for a weekend. The second one, longer, third longer. And every time she went, Connie would take us in and just let us stay for a while. Look at this. Look at this. Take this off the hanger and see if that'll fit her. Whenever we would ask, you Connie, can we fit? go get ice cream? Connie, can we go swimming? She'd always say yes. And it gave us a break from, you know, what it was like at home. Say, <laughs> so we're going to use this and wipe you up. It showed me that, like, there's more than one way that a family can be. I heard that. Well, no, I wish to have a birthday and then he uh, made fun of us because Ohio State horribly lost to Purdue. Years ago, this agency contacted me and said, well, we have a young mom. They were sending her to like a job core kind of program where she would move there and they needed some place for the baby to stay, and that was Emmy. I promise I won't let you see. Yes, you I won't let you From the time she was one and a half, we had her, and then when it got to kindergarten age, she gave us custody, and we had already had Xavier and Jaylin, who are, they're all siblings. So we had all three of them that we had been watching. So it was a big step in faith for their mom because she was very afraid that we were just gonna get custody and then never let her see him. But we still have a great relationship with her. Usually about once a month, she'll have him for the weekend. But this is home. You know, they know that this is home. Tag, 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 run through, run through, oh!
down. All right, here, lay down. Good night. Well, I grew up about six miles from here on a farm out in Willowdale. As a child, I just was a tomboy. Played outside, lived on a farm, you know, played softball, road bike. I was kind of the kid that my older sister and brother, whatever you do, I'm going to do it better. I had to be the center of attention. My parents both worked. Our grandmother lived with us too, so grandma and I didn't get along, not going to lie. One time I remember her, like, someday you're going to have a husband and children. You're going to need to peel potatoes for him. And I said, Grandma, if I ever have a husband, he will peel potatoes for me, and I'm not having kids. My relationship with God as a child was, was forced, you know, go to church, go to religion class, pray the rosary with Grandma. She prayed it so slow, it drove me crazy. That was prayer to me, this recited prayer where you just had to sit through, it was boring when I was confirmed in the eighth grade. I was one of those kids that went through the class thinking, well, I don't know if I'm gonna be confirmed. I'm not sure I wanna be. I don't wanna do just what my parents said, even though they would've totally made me. But the priest at the time said, you know, saints just aren't all these holy dead people. Every one of you can be a saint. And I thought to myself, well, there's somebody that's given me a challenge. I'm gonna be a saint. As an eighth grader, I told myself, really, that's possible to be a saint? So when I got confirmed, I took it very seriously. Like, I am gonna let God do something in me. I don't know what it is, but I'm going to live that life to make the world a better place. This is the kitchen, and realistically, we usually have so many people that it's, um, we eat at the table and the bar here, and very often it's help yourself style the foods up here, and you get it, and you sit down, because everybody's coming and going at different times. It's family time, you know, living rooms. I can show you the upstairs. And then the girls, when they move in with us, they have a room up here. And this here is what we call the Rustic Hope Room. As you can see, it's not as clean as I would like it, but it's the girls' responsibility to keep it clean. They do their own laundry, put their own clothes away. So we have room for up to four moms in here. This is another Rusticope room. And we had a young mom that lived here that got upset with me because I, um, I talked to her about taking care of her kids better, holding them, playing with them. And she got upset and she left. That's been over a week ago and she left all her things, left everything as is. Um, she'll be back, but sometimes they don't always want to hear the truth. All right, down here is the toy room. This is where the kids can play. We've got their little imagination station in the corner that's all full of markers and crayons and paint. And we have extra beds down here for people. And the pictures on the walls are all children that have lived in our home. We have enough room for 17 people to sleep, and that doesn't count couches, that's beds. That's pretty much it. So are we going for donuts, girl? What kind of donuts do you want? The Berkeys, they just did all of it. Like they would just show up, not even tell me. I'd drive by and I'd see their truck there and they were working, the two of them side by side working, getting the whole inside done. Or I'd probably still be sitting in a building that's half done. When we were working on the ceiling, the week before I said, Connie, we need them to over for the ceiling. Close. Yeah, I'll pray about it. I said, oh, okay. So the next week we get there and I said, Connie, you got the ceiling yet? We're ready for the ceiling. Oh, I forgot to pray about it. I'll pray about it right now. I said, okay, pray about it right now. So this we, is a crazy woman that, <laughs> that we have so, to deal with on a regular basis. So that day, a farmer shows up with a check for $1,000. He said, here I am. I don't know why, but here I am today. 
My job is uh, you may have a pickup somewhere like uh, where somebody calls and may have some furniture to go get or or a mom that needs uh, help with something or something's broke or you know so kind of like the handyman behind the scene and working down at the shed so I'm under construction you know building something. When Connie brought up Rusty Coat Ministry, yeah, I was on the fence. And, and one of the biggest factors for me was what was people going to think? And we raised five kids, you know, what, you know, what are we doing? Let's just stay in our little, little bubble, just like a, a normal family. That stuck with me for a long, for quite a while. And it hurt our marriage, it hurt with our with our family over time god has showed me that it took connie to break me down to realize what you know what life is really about it took it wasn't just like a a light switch on you know wow you know i guess i was all along kept being the the Doubting Thomas, and now I'm 150% aboard. If your trust is in God, first and foremost, everything else will all work out. I went to an abortion clinic to pray with our church. I don't know why, I had a lot of anxiety about going. In the hour that I was there, 15 girls went in. Every girl that went in the door was having an abortion. They, you know, had hoodies on, were looking down at the ground, um, sunglasses. They were padded down at the door. Coats were taken, purses were taken, cell phones were taken. Nobody went in with them. They look like my friends. They look like, you know, my niece, you know. They looked scared and ashamed, but they thought that that's what they, that was their best option. I got back in my car, I hung my rosary up on my mirror, and that's when I realized I had not said one prayer. The whole time I was there, I was just in complete shock at the reality of this is what abortion is. And for the first time, I had empathy for the moms. They didn't want to be there. They didn't, for whatever reason, they thought it was their best option. And on the drive home, I prayed like I never prayed. I sobbed. And I asked God to use me to be a better option. 
everything in that one instant changed because that's the first time I prayed and said, whatever you want me to do, I'm willing. Are you nervous? I am nervous. You look nervous. nervous. I am nervous. I'm Trayla Fisher. I'm 22 years old. I have had four kids, two on earth, two in heaven. Mostly grew up with my mammal in multiple different little towns. She was like a mom. She still is like a mom. She's a better mom than my mom was. My name is Christina. I have three kids and I'm originally from Logan County. My favorite part of each day would probably be my children. Like, they're probably the reason I get up every morning. <laughs> Even if they're having a horrible day. <laughs> my daughter's a drama queen. <laughs> uh, I've had a, my, my motto is, stuff happens. <laughs> you get over it, you survive it. I was took in by my aunt and uncle when I was three. We were physically, mentally, and emotionally abused by our biological parents. So my aunt and uncle took us in, and then five years, me and my sister were raped and molested. So at the age of 16, we got put in foster care. I think the last time I see my biological parents, I was four. I actually miscarried a child from rape. I pretty much walked out of foster care saying I'd never get married, I'd never have kids. I was a rape baby. I didn't know my dad. He contacted me on Facebook, I was 14 and then went to prison. Like about a year before I met Connie, I got into drugs, I got into being homeless, I lived in my car with my toddler, and I got pregnant with my daughter. We literally would go to the women's center and get the five diapers a day. That's, that's it, we lived on cereal. She came over, brought stuff for two, three months, on my, like, on the porch. And that was the first time I actually got to sit down and meet her. Like, to come home and, like, all your problems are solved, basically, with your kid. Like, you know, I didn't know where I was going to get his diapers from. I didn't know where I was going to be able to afford another can of formula. And she came in my house. She sat down. She's like, comfy, you know? Like, OK. And we just talked and talked and talked. She just from there on out. Whenever I needed diapers, if I needed formula, if I needed even gas money, she helped. I was trying to leave my kids as dad, and I didn't have anything to my name. He was basically my lifeboat. I moved in with him when I got out of foster care. The night that I realized, hey, my kids shouldn't be seeing this, I had my two-year-old son standing in the doorway and watched his dad pick me up by my neck and throw me into the wall. I like tried to get away from Brad myself a couple times before I met Connie and never got far enough to be able to do it. My neighbor upstairs, she was a high school friend of mine, um, got a hold of Connie. She showed up, I think, two days after that with a whole van full of stuff, um, about $1,500 donated for Francis Furniture to furnish an apartment for me. She gave us everything we needed in our house, like hygiene products, bathroom stuff, kitchen stuff, food. She even got my kids presents, diapers, wipes, like. She gave me like, I wanna say 10 gas cards and gift cards for store, yeah. I would not have gotten out if it wasn't for Connie. <laughs> I just didn't see that I was worth anything more than what I was in. And Connie showed me different. <laughs> You know, Rushi's a small town. In the community, at first, definitely people looked at me like, oh, yeah, that Connie's a little out there. You know, she's just that crazy woman. Yeah, she's taking in a couple girls into her home, whatever. The older generation will say, why don't they get a job? Just tell them to get a job. They do work, you know, but they also have to pay daycare. Of course. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> I 
had an older lady tell me, back when I was a kid, this is what people did. They just helped each other. And, you know, younger kids coming up, you know, saying, hey, you're the baby lady. My mom was like, I'll just make them get a job or do this. Well, she now will come here and volunteer and say, well, those ladies are so nice. Those girls are so nice. But it's awesome because I do feel a lot more support now. When people get involved and volunteer, I think they oh, realize that, that you know, I'm no better than anybody else. Yeah. How it have changed us? We actually had two ladies that lived with us over the last year. Okay, I need you to carry your plate like a big girl. After I graduate high school, I plan on being a nurse. I want to work in like the traumatic center of the ER where it's like the worst of the worst. I'm, I'm pretty stable, like I'm not bouncing from place to place, I'm not bouncing from job to job, I have responsibility. There's a lot more to me than being scared. I wouldn't be here without her. <laughs> I don't think I'd really be here if she wouldn't have stepped in there. She's motivational, she's inspiring, she's awesome. <laughs> Way to go, she makes us you think outside the box. It's like, gosh, could I be a foster parent, you know, or could I do this? And not many people can inspire you to do that. He is. I've seen moms just scream at Connie and yell at her, and the next day or a week later, their, their kids are back here. She's babysitting or watching them or taking that same mom somewhere. You know, if she would have threw in the towel and said. I ain't helping you no more. Well, where would they be? How many times do we pray for people when we are supposed to be the answer to the prayer? I truly believe that if you every day say the simple prayer, use me, use me to serve you, God is not going to say, oh, look at cute little Annie in third grade, you know, honey, when you get bigger, I'll see if I can find something for you. No, he's going to use you today and tomorrow and the next day. He's going to use you every day that you're willing. Do I think Connie's crazy? You see how many kids she has in here? She's gotta be crazy. <laughs> the crazy people are the best people. So.